Check, check, check. <laughs> All right, can we hear? Am I there? All right. Good morning, everybody. Good to see everybody as you come on in and we start our time here. And uh, for those of you joining us online as well, good morning, good morning. I'm going to begin our time with a reading of Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words, whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit is to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. Thank you, Kurt. And along with that scripture, it says in Exodus 20, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. Let's stand and sing together. Number 128, I sing the mighty power of God. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at his command and all stars obey. I sing the goodness of the Lord that filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed where'er I turn my eye. If I survey the ground I tread or gaze upon the sky. There's not a plant or flower below but makes thy glories known. Thy clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne. While all that borrows life from thee song about our God, the Creator. And now the next song is one that we all know and love. It's number 147, How Great Thou Art. And it's... <laughs> oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider I hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Glades I wander and hear the bird sing sweetly in the tree. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and 
feel the gentle breeze Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee Son not sparing, send him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross my burden gladly buried, he bled and died to take away my sin. shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Sing it out to the Lord, then sings my singing this morning. Now turn to those around you and bless them. Say, bless you. God bless you. I'm impressed by how quick you guys stopped greeting this morning. Oh, normally, it takes at least 15 minutes to get up here. Oh, first off, connection cards. In the pews, put them in the back. We also have a thing called a website that you can go to as well and contact us that way. Uh, a new four-week season uh, Spring Life Group series is up. It's happening now. It's called The Gospel. Uh, what is the gospel? There are tables outside in the patio that you can sign up for a life group. 
Guys, this is where we get together, uh, do life together, study God's word, and uh, do the one another's of scripture. So really get plugged into those. Uh, next up is an all-church workday on April 20th. Come out and help work on the campus. Uh, blood, sweat, and tears. But lunch will be provided, so that is good. Uh, finally, on May 3rd to the 5th, there's Women's Retreat at Thousand Pines. The price is $290. Uh, once again, great time to fellowship with women and stuff like that. Unfortunately, guys, you can't go. So ours is in November. November. So, yeah. Thank you. there. Maybe you're, okay. Who's excited about the eclipse? That's what I was saying. Okay, there we go. So, and we'll get a little bit, they say what, up 49, 50%. So uh, be watching for it and use the glasses that you're supposed to use. Yeah. So, um, but, you know, some people are afraid of eclipses and some people almost worship them. They're you know, so cool and stuff. Um, but we know the God who created, set everything in motion, and uh, he also created us and knows each of us by name. So that's wonderful, and we're going to sing about God. Let's stand as we sing. <laughs>
kind of key in uh, part of our scripture today that uh, a lot of people see all this stuff and they think it's great. They go to the Grand Canyon or whatever like that, um, but they don't give thanks to God. So um, that's partly what this next song is about. We have so much to, to thank God about, don't we? Amen. Yeah. 
Don't you get shy on me, lift up your You got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Come on, my soul. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside. to lift you up and praise and I just um, pray that right now that we have our focus attention on you we'd be listening well to what uh, Pastor Jared has to share with us and just um, thank you again for um, your beautiful creation in Jesus name amen 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 good morning church it's good to see everybody today uh, thank you, Ron, choir, man, just a great morning of worshiping the Lord already. Um, some of those songs I haven't sung indescribable, I think, in, in years, and it's one of my absolute favorites, right? Indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And all I have to bring is what? A hallelujah. That's all. What does hallelujah mean? Praise God. That's all I can bring, right? I have nothing to give him. He is so other than me. <laughs> all I can bring him is my hallelujah, my praise God. We make assumptions about God all the time, do we not? We, we try to describe him, but as that song said, he is kind of indescribable, uncontainable, and yet the Bible says certain things about him that we can know. But we need to make sure that we go where to know those things about God. we got to go here, right? We can see things around us, but be careful not to make assumptions about God. So what are some of the assumptions that we make about God and what he is like? Some believe that God is angry all the time. He is interested only in punishing people, right? That that's all that God is, right? Just super angry man upstairs, right? Others believe that God is, is loving and interested in unconditionally loving all people, okay? Even those that don't acknowledge him, he's just all about love, right? Okay? Well, then there are those who, are believe, who believe that God is a genie, okay? Anybody believe that God is a genie, that you can just kind of take your magic lamp, you know, rub it, and out he pops, and God, I want this and this and this, but you can't wish for more than three things because that's not, wait, okay, that's another story. But anyways, right? That God is this genie that will do what you want if you, if, or if you believe in him enough, you have enough faith, you'll get whatever you want, 
right? I don't know. These are assumptions that we make about God, which might be a part of the picture, a little piece of it here and there, some truth here and there, but not the full picture of who God is. Last week, we celebrated the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What an amazing morning that was to gather together in here to celebrate. We had the organ, the piano, the choir, the kids who like killed it. And we just had a great time together. We enjoyed some amazing um, snacks across the way and some great fellowship time taking pictures and just being together as the body. What a great day that was. Um, And we looked in here at, at what Jesus revealed about the cost of following him and how he proved undoubtedly that he is worth the cost. Now this week, if you haven't noticed yet, there's a different graphic up on our screen. We're taking a little break. If somehow you crawled into a hole and you didn't realize that we've been announcing this over the past month, which I know sometimes happens because I put announcements out and people go, what announcements? I don't know what those are. What bulletin? I don't read that thing, right? Um, but anyways, we are, we are taking a break from Matthew's gospel to ask the question, what is the gospel? Now, you would think that it, you know, being part of a church that we know exactly what the gospel is. But I want to venture to say that there are many in the church, many who have grown up in the church, many who who are active in the church who still don't really fully know what the gospel is. And I know that because I've actually asked people what's the gospel and what do I get? Crickets. Crickets. Or nobody, nobody knows. And that shouldn't be friends. And so what we're going to do, we're going to look at what the gospel is. We're going to look at four steps in this process, four important things that we need to understand to know exactly what the gospel is, because it is the power of God for our salvation. Amen? Amen. So we need to know what it is. So first and foremost, we have to know that there is a God and that this God is holy and righteous and he is the one who has created all things. He is the foundation of the gospel message. This morning and in our life groups, again, shameless plug, please join a life group. If you're not part of one, try it out for these next four weeks, please. There are sign-up sheets outside, information's on the, on the website. You can come talk to me or call the office, sign up for a life group, Sunday morning options, groups that meet throughout the week, just to dig into this message, to work out the implications of this foundation. And so today we're going to be looking at that, following mostly Romans chapter 1 through 5. I'll do with a little bit today and we'll go uh, further. But let's go ahead and ask the Lord's blessing on our time. Pray with me, please. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are good. We thank you that even though you are indescribable and uncontainable, yet you looked at us and you said, I know your heart and, and, I, and I want you. I want you in relationship with me. And I, and I know that that's impossible without Jesus. And so May we get the end right as well as we we think of of what Jesus did for us and our response to him. But today, Lord, help us to focus in on who this God is, this God who is completely holy, completely righteous, who has created all things and who deserves all honor and glory. All praise goes to you. May we get on our knees today, Lord, in surrender to the God of the universe. We pray this in his awesome and holy name. Amen. Amen. So again, like I said, our main text for the next four weeks is the first four chapters of Romans. And so I figure we need to do a little bit of background work to set the stage for this. Now, this won't be my typical sermon where the entire sermon is on the background to a certain book because we're not going to do that. Otherwise, we're going to be here forever. Um, So that won't be that. But I'm just going to highlight some of the most important stuff today. As is commonly known, the epistle or letter of Romans was written by the Apostle Paul to the saints in Rome to address specific issues that the church was facing. Many consider it to be Paul's theological treatise, if you will. As we also know, the city of Rome had grown from a small city that was built upon seven hills to an entire enormous empire covering much of the known world. Now, without going into too much detail, the religious climate was one of syncretistic polytheism. Say that five times fast, right? 
Syncretistic basically means you take elements from all sorts of different things, you put them together like a big lump of clay, and then voila, you have a brown, ugly mess. Yeah, that's what syncretism is. And so it's syncretistic. They're taking pieces from everywhere. But it's also polytheism or polytheistic, which means they worship many gods, okay? The Romans had adopted the pantheon of the Greek gods, changing their name to Roman names. Therefore, Zeus becomes Jupiter, and Poseidon becomes Neptune, and Aphrodite becomes Venus. And yes, kids, those are the names of our planets, Isn't that awesome that we named planets after Roman gods? Very, very cool. Okay. They are also considered the emperor to be a god, a god on earth. And so they worshiped him as well. In fact, they just worshiped anything and everything, including themselves, which is kind of sad and and not okay. Um, Now, the church in Rome was both a church of Roman Uh, sorry, of Jewish and Gentile believers. These are Jewish believers trying to figure out how their Jewish faith translates into Christianity. And now we have Gentile believers trying to figure out how they fit in. Now, presumably there were tensions between those two groups. And we'll see that a lot as Paul addresses what's going on. And so Paul's letter was written to make sure that those two groups were united in their understanding of the gospel especially as they face that polytheistic, anything-goes, religious climate around them. Sort of sounds like America today. Yeah. So you think the Bible's relative for us? I think so. According to the ESV Study Bible, the theme of Romans is the revelation of God's judging and saving righteousness in the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the cross of Christ, God judges sin and yet at the same time manifests his saving mercy. We might say that the theme verse for Romans is Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, which says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it The righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Okay? I hear the word being preached back at me right now. That's awesome. Okay, cool. All right, so this is the theme of the book of Romans and really the theme for our series on what is the gospel. Um, For I'm not ashamed, right? And we'll definitely see this play out over the next four weeks. With that in mind, let's continue in Romans. We're going to look at verse 18 through 21. So if you haven't gotten there yet, open your Bibles up. We're going to camp out here today. It says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in things that have been made, so they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Awesome. That's some good news for this morning, right? If you're on his side. But if you're not, you're one of those whose foolish heart has been darkened. Now, while we see here much here about man, we'll save that for next week when my good friend Chris Kamalski, who spoke for us before, is coming back to share with us. I'm excited about that for next week. But today we're talking about God, the holy and righteous creator. So if we look at verse 19 and 20, that God, the, the creator, we're kind of looking at the middle. Um, what does it mean to say that God is creator? Now, this should be self-explanatory, Right? And so much of our history, um, we, we wouldn't have even needed to define that. But if you ask people today what that means, people are clueless. They don't know. They don't understand this idea of um, God as creator. And to say that God is creator is to say that he is the first cause. He is the one who caused everything to come into being. To say that God is creator is to say that he is the unmovable mover. 
These are things that philosophers like to define God as. We say that he is the ground of all being. In fact, his name, his revealed name that he revealed to Moses out of that burning bush was the name of Yahweh, which means to be, or I am that I am, right? It's the ground of being. It was a name that the Jews felt was so holy that they would not say it out loud. And they, changed, they, they put vowel markings in the scripture to make sure that they didn't even say that name, right? So holy. Um, and this is who God is. Wayne Grudem defines the doctrine of creation like this. He said, God created the entire universe out of nothing. It was originally very good, and he created it to glorify himself. So if we deny creation ex nihilo, or out of nothing, we deny God's sovereignty and his independence. All one needs to do to see the significance of God as creator is to start at the very beginning. A very good place to start. The first chapter Nay, the first verse of the first book of the Bible, Genesis 1.1. Say it with me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The rest of the chapter reveals much about this God who creates. He created everything. All things were created by him. He is also a God of order. There was evening, and there was morning the first day, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day, and all these things are created in a very orderly fashion. And in fact, at the very beginning, it says that he, he was hovering over the waters, and the waters was a symbol of a place of chaos and conflict, and God takes that chaos and turns it into order, okay? So he created order. He's an orderly God. But then he also, later on, we see at the end of chapter one that he creates mankind in what? In his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. And every day he said, looked at, at, looking at his creation, he said, this is good. And at the end, after he created mankind, he said, this is very good. So God created something. In fact, he created all things, and he created it to be good. Now, something happened though, right? Something happened to mess that all up. We'll look at that next week. <laughs> the passage that we began our service with today tells us in Psalm 19.1 that the heavens declare the glories of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. John, uh, John Foreman, lead singer of one of my favorite Christian bands. Anybody know? Switchfoot. Lead singer of Switchfoot, one of my favorite Christian bands, um, said this. He said, I love the night sky. It reminds me of how small and insignificant I and my problems are in light of the infinite. When I look at the stars, anybody know it? No? Okay, cool. It's a great song. Look it up. Stars by Switchfoot, because it talks about this idea that God is infinite and God is other. And so when we look at him, we look at the stars, we can understand who we are in light of that. The meat in the middle of our main text today in Romans 1, 19 through 20. Again, for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Now you talk about meaty. That's some meaty scripture right there. It's kind of like that busy bee belly buster sandwich. Anybody have Busy Bee and Pedro before? If, if not, man, go and take five of you and eat one sandwich together because it is meaty. But anyways, did you know that the most significant word used the most frequently in Romans is not actually Jesus, it's not Christ, it's not sin, it's not law, it's not grace. It is the Greek word theos or theos, which means God. God. Robert Yarborough said, God in his magnificence, magnificence, sorry, splendor and glory, a word which also appears 15 times in Romans, is the theological bedrock of the book of Romans. There are so many implications of the claim that God created everything. It means this, that the world itself, the creation, is not the ultimate reality. It is not all there is. It also gives meaning to our existence. It means that we are not just the result of random chance. It also means that we are not autonomous. And this is where the rub is for a lot of people, right? Because what do we want to be? 
autonomous. We want to be free to rule our own lives and do our own thing, right? But the problem is we owe something to this God who has created us, right? God rules over all the universe because he created it. And God has the right then to tell his creation how to live. Nothing is to be worshipped instead of God or in addition to him. The universe has meaning and purpose. It is to bring him glory. Westminster Catechism said the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. I love that part too, right? Because not only do we get to glorify him, but we get to enjoy him and all of his benefits. Praise God for that. Greg Gilbert said, we are made by him, owned by him, dependent on him, and therefore accountable to him. Because creation reveals the creator and certain things about the creator, like his power and attributes that we see here in Romans, even without special revelation, which would be scripture, with just the general revelation, which is creation, man is still what? Without excuse. Without excuse. So whether you or not you even pick this up, you just look at the things that were made, and you see God's attributes, and you know that we are without excuse. And that's a scary thought. Don't blame the Creator for a lack of evidence. Stars, mountains, rainbows, seasons, oceans, animals, trees, beehives, roses. Need I go on? All things point to the fact that there is a God and that He's created. But there's something else that we need to address about this God. Because see, a lot of people can look at the stars and know that there is something beyond us. But we also have to know something about this God as well. And what we have to know about this God is that He is holy and He is righteous. Now, what does it mean to say that God is holy? That's a word we throw around a lot in Christian circles. We sang about it a lot today. Um, the word holy means to be set apart. That's the literal definition of the word holy. One commentator said, holiness implies absolute moral purity and separateness above the creation. Now that's God's holiness, not, not ours, okay? This is made crystal clear in Isaiah's vision of the Lord. You know, from Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah 6, 1 through 3 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. And with two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the whole earth is full of his glory. See, the imagery is clear. This is a God who is completely other than man. He is completely transcendent. He is holy, 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 right? They could have just said holy one time, but no, they said it three times. Why? For emphasis, for completion, right? If something is repeated three times like this, it serves to intensify it. We may well say, like kids would say, that God is holy to the gazillionth degree or infinity times infinity, and beyond. Um, even a superhuman creature, like the seraphim, is humbled before God. A.W. Tozer reminds us of this. I love this. He says, We must not think of God as highest in an ascending order of beings, starting with the single cell and going up from the fish to the bird to the animal to man, the angel to cherub to God. God is as high above an archangel as above a caterpillar. For the gulf that separates the archangel from the caterpillar is still but finite, while the gulf between God and the archangel is infinite. God is completely other. And if we don't understand this fact, if we don't understand the holiness of God, we will never understand the depths of our sin, right? So that's why I'm preaching on this today. So he is holy. Not only is he holy, but he is also 
righteous God. What does it mean to say that God is, is righteous? So many Psalms declare the righteousness of God. For instance, Psalm 50 verse 6 says, the heavens declare his righteousness for God himself is judge. Notice the connection to God as judge. When we say that God is righteous, it is connected with his justice. In other words, he is the one who rightly judges all things. That's what his righteousness really is, right? Um, Psalm 97, 1 through 2 says, The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. So if he is not righteous, if he is not just, what happens to his throne? It falls apart. There's no foundation. So those things are absolutely necessary for God to be. If he wasn't reliable, if he wasn't faithful in keeping his promises, there is no foundation. John, uh, C. John Collins says, commonly in the Psalms, God's righteousness is his reliability, his faithfulness to keep his promises. Now, connecting the two, we may say that God's righteous is his justice faithfully executed. God is just and he is faithful to bring about his justice. Okay, all well and good, PJ. We have a creator God. We have a God who is holy other than us. We have a God who is righteous and completely faithful in his justice. All well and good, but how does this relate to the gospel? Way back in 2021, which is what, three years ago now? Have we forgotten everything that happened in 2021? We were meeting outside in the parking lot. It's kind of craziness at the beginning of the year. We were studying the book of Exodus. We focused on the theme, show me your glory. When Moses had the gall to ask this question of God, God actually does so in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 and 7. Interestingly, what he does is reveals specific attributes about his character and actions in keeping with that character. So look with me at Exodus 34, 6 through 7, right? This is God had hid Moses in that cleft of the rock, couldn't pass by him because he was going to die if he did so. But but when God walks by him, he he uses these words. He says, it says this in verse 6 of Exodus 34, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Oh, yay. That's good news. God is, God's loving. He's, he's awesome. He's compassionate. He is, he's forgiving. He's, he's faithful. That's what we hope This morning is all about, right? We can go home now. God's mercy, grace, patience, love, faithfulness, right? But what'd you notice? That's not where the passage ends. That's not all that God says. God says something else. We forgot the second half of verse 7. Pastor, how dare you stop in the middle of verse and not be contextual? This is what it says. But who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation? Oh, there's the bad news. I guess we better stay here. What this reveals is that God is also the holy and righteous one. And finally, just in case you forgot, back to our passage in Romans. Earlier we dealt with the meat. Now it's time to deal with the bread of the sandwich, verse 18 and 21. This isn't some plain white bread. This is like that Dave's killer bread. (laughs) If you ever had that stuff. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. And the first part of verse 20, 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. 
Again, we'll save man's part in this for next week, but what does this reveal to us about God? What are the implications of the justice and the righteousness and the holiness of God? As the one who is perfectly holy, who is perfectly just, who is perfectly righteous, he deserves honor and thanks. He deserves our gratitude. He cannot tolerate sin. That's something we don't like to hear, friends. We don't like to hear that there's something within us that God looks at and goes, yuck, to. Yeah. Now, we do know that there's something within us, a.k.a. we are created in His image, that He goes and says, okay, that's good. But it's marred. It's messed up. It's flawed. It's fallen. And he cannot tolerate sin. And he will deal decisively with it. His wrath will be, nay, is, as Romans says, is revealed against all ungodliness, i.e. lack of holiness and unrighteousness. And so the foundation of this gospel message, of the truth of the gospel, is the fact that there is a God who has created all things, and he is holy and righteous. And I do want to say one more so as not to leave us in bad news. He is also a God who loves us. Let's not forget that either, right? The foundational point of the gospel, without which we cannot move ahead, is that there is a God, and we owe him everything. Because he is the creator, all of creation owes him allegiance. All is accountable to him. And because he is holy and righteous, his righteous wrath will be revealed against sin. And man is without excuse. But the good news is, all right, I'll give you a preview. The good news is that even though mankind has sinned, there was a perfect man who lived a perfect life. But not only was he man, fully man, he was also fully God. And this man, this God, died upon a cross and his blood was shed so that you and I might receive forgiveness of sin. And that is what we are here to celebrate today. Let's pray. Ushers, will you get ready for the communion, please? Or this reminds me that, that I have nothing, nothing to give to a king. My righteousness is filthy rags. I, like all, have fallen short of the glory of God because I have sinned. And I know that the wages of sin is death. Because I know that you are a holy God. And I know that you are a righteous and just God. And I know because you've created all things, everything owes its existence to you. And so all I can give is my hallelujah. As I throw up my hands and sing hallelujah. Praise God, because I didn't deserve what you gave to me. We didn't deserve you. And yet you gave yourself and your son, Jesus Christ. And so all we can do is say thank you and praise you. It's in your awesome name we pray. Amen. Ushers, please come forward. Cheryl's going to play. As we do some business with God this morning, let's do some business with him. He is holy. He is righteous. He is creator. He deserves it all. An element. Take the elements and hold on to them. And we'll bless them in a minute.
Today we've worshipped and learned about this God who is completely other than us, who has created all things, who deserves our allegiance, who deserves honor and glory and praise. And yet because this God loves us so much and, and knows our condition, He took on flesh. What God does that? What, what God would stoop so low, would not consider equality, this now I'm talking about the Son with God, something to be grasped, but would make himself, empty himself, make himself nothing. Step down into human existence. There's only one I know. And he is our God, who is worthy of praise. And his son died on a cross, his body broken, so that we could have life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus, for taking on flesh and allowing that flesh to be broken once again so that we could be made whole in you. Or may we never take this for granted. This is not just a piece of bread that we're eating. It's not magic. There's nothing special other than what it represents. But through this, we receive grace upon grace upon grace every day. Bread of life. You laid down your life. And all we can do is say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. He was in that upper room with his disciples. He took the bread and he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat all. When we think about the holiness of God, and we look at ourselves, I look at myself, I wonder, Lord God, how could you love me? Why would you love me? But because he is a God, not only of absolute holiness and righteousness, but a God of abundant love, he did what the song said, he looked beyond my fault, my sin, and he saw my need. And he sent his precious son to pay the debt I owed I could never, never pay. That's a holy God. That's a merciful God. That's a God that you and I can humble ourselves before. Say, praise you, praise you. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to take of the cup that signifies your son's death on our behalf, he didn't have to do it. He wasn't forced to do it. He willingly did it. You willingly did it, Lord Jesus. For us, we thank you for your shed blood, which cleanses us of all our sin. Hallelujah. On that night in the upper room, the Lord Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Take and drink all of it in remembrance of me. Sing our closing song. Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, Christ Jesus had become our righteousness, our holiness, our redemption. Let's sing together, There is a Redeemer. There is a Redeemer, Jesus 
We thankful that he has given us his son and his spirit, that he is still on the throne, that he is holy above all. Psalm 8, 3 and 4 kind of encapsulates this morning, I think, more than anything else. It says, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? and the Son of Man, that you care for Him. Isn't it amazing that our God, who is great above all, came and became one of us? What is man? Thank you that you are mindful of us, Lord. God bless you guys. Have a great week. Join a life group if you can over these next four weeks as we dig further in to what is the gospel. We love you watching at home. We'll see you soon. Have a great day, everyone.